Welcome to New Hampshire's Wild Side. I'm Mark Beauchene. And I'm Christina Luby. We'll take you behind the scenes of the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department to learn more about the people and projects of your wildlife agency. We'll share with you tips and tactics to help you make the most of your time while in New Hampshire's woods and waters. And along the way, you'll meet real people who love life outdoors. Now, let's discover more about New Hampshire's Wild Side. Hi, I'm Denny Corvo, New England's Wild Chef. Are you out of ideas of what to do with your ground venison? My daughter Kaylee loves this recipe for venison ravioli. Part of putting our recipe together is browning up some venison for the filling. So I've got a preheated pan. And to that, I'm adding some ground venison. Now, what I'm gonna do is I like to break it up a little bit. It helps it to cook more evenly. So just take a spatula and break up your venison. And to that, I'm gonna add some shallots, which adds a little sweetness. And now I'm gonna add a little savory. I'm gonna add a little roasted garlic, some of my Sicilian blend, which has oregano and fennel, carrot, things like that. And then I'm gonna to continue to brown my venison until it's cooked about three quarters of the way through. You wanna make sure you have enough olive oil in the pan, because that'll add the fat content needed to keep your venison from going dry. Now remember, this is gonna be a filling, so you wanna break up the venison into very small pieces. So it looks like we've come down the home stretch, and our venison looks like it's cooked where it needs to be. And now we're ready to cool it down and get it ready for the filling on the ravioli. Our venison is done, our ricotta is mixed. Now I'm gonna grab our pasta sheets and assemble the ravioli. You start by taking a sheet of pasta and you layer it over the top of a pasta press. Now what I like to do is just, just make sure that it's nice and even. Now part of the pasta press, you have a top piece and what you do is place that on top and gently push down. Once you do that and you set the pasta, you gently remove it and now you have the pockets to fill. So to fill them, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take some of the ground venison that we cooked up and we're gonna place some of that into each pocket. Now it doesn't take an awful lot, so you gotta keep in mind that you have two fillings and you wanna leave enough room so that you can put both fillings in. So with these pasta sheets, you can roll them fresh or you can buy them pre-made. So we're gonna take a little bit of our ricotta mixture and we're gonna place a little bit of that over the top. And this has things in it like fresh grated parm and nutmeg, a little fresh ground pepper, and some roasted garlic. So there's a lot of flavor going on here. So now we've got the filling in our pasta sheet. Now we're gonna lay the top layer over it after I do something first, which is you always wanna keep a little bit of water. Take your finger and just run along the edges where it's gonna seal. And what that'll do is that'll help the pasta to stick together to make your ravioli. Okay, so all our edges are all wet. So I'm gonna take another pasta sheet and I'm gonna go equal length right across the top of it. And I'm gonna gently just push down so that I can start to seal the edges. So then you take a rolling pin and slowly work the ravioli pasta back and forth Sometimes I even go crosswise, and you can see as I'm doing it, it seal those edges. Once you know that you have them pretty well sealed, now you want to apply a little pressure to secure those edges. Okay, so here's our first little batch. Now very gently break the edges off. Beautiful. Flip it over and I'm gonna gently take a couple of fingers and just gently push to release it. So one extra step that I take is I grab a fork and then I just go around the edges and just push on those edges with the edge of the fork. And that just makes me feel a little bit better when I drop them into that hot water that my raviolis will be okay. 
And then the next step is really to just lean them so that they can dry for about five or 10 minutes right before we drop them into the hot boiling water. Our water is boiling, so I'm gonna salt it up a little bit. Our pasta sat for about 10 minutes to stiffen up. Now they're ready to drop into the pan of water. So this is fresh pasta, it's not gonna take very long. What you're looking for is the ravioli to rise, and it only takes a few minutes, maybe three minutes, four minutes tops. So as you can see, our pasta has risen, it's ready, didn't take very long, and now we're gonna go plate it. I've made a little red sauce that I'm gonna to top them off with. Hit them with a little fresh parm. Oh man. Mmm. That's really good. I'm New England's wild chef, Denny Corvo. This one's for my daughter, Kaylee. Manja. New Hampshire Fishing Game manages over 500 species of wildlife. Take an inside look on how it's done. are amazing. They're like the only flying mammals. They use echolocation just like dolphins do. They eat tons of mosquitoes, they eat tons of um, forest pests and agricultural pests. If you want to think about that just in terms of your backyard, if one bat eats a thousand mosquitoes a night and you have ten bats, then that's ten thousand mosquitoes gone from your backyard. In 2009, unfortunately, white nose syndrome came to New Hampshire and uh, surveys over the next few years, up to 2014, we really saw major declines in all our mines. Summer bat counts are really critical. We're just trying to even see where we have survivors. Um, and then also, you know, taking it to the next level and looking at, are there areas where there are more survivors? Are there things that are special about those sites? So we're also, you know, feeding the information into more detailed information where we can try and see, are there things we could be doing to create better summer habitat? What we're doing is we are counting bats, the little brown bats and the big brown bats that live in structures like barns and churches and in your attic sometimes. And as they emerge from the buildings, we are counting them as they come out. And what that information gives us is we find out where bats are coming for the summer. And when they come in the summer to our areas, to our barns and our, our attics and our um, church steeples, they're coming to reproduce. So they're having their pups in the summer. This looks like we'll be at a good angle to see the bats drop out of them. Yeah, I agree. That's a good spot. And then see how you've got the roof line? Mm -hmm. When they come out and they go against the sky, you'll be able to see them. The counting part is really easy. And it's a methodology that people are using all over the country, and especially in the Northeast, to count bats in the, in the buildings. What time yep. is it, Sandy? Um, it looks like it's just about half an hour before sunset. So perfect. It's like perfect timing you know, to get started. You keep an eye out, and I'll, I'll make some notes about the weather. Great. Let's see. What do you think the sky? It looks pretty overcast to me. We don't have to stay here all night. We're just going to start at about half hour before sunset like we are, but then we'll stop when it gets too dark to see them anymore. So usually that's like 40 minutes. I think I've seen the first oh, one drop. Okay, good. I'm going to make okay. a note of that. I'm going to tally him on the sheet. You're right. So you got the first time. I'll make a note of the time. There's two more. So I've got the hash marks. I'm making them. And then we can count them up at the end. Oh, you know what? That one went back in. Very separate column. Yep. So then at the end, we'll, we've got to remember to subtract the ones that come out from the ones that go back in. So we get our total number. Three more. Oh, good. Do you have any more bug spray? I'm glad we brought a whole bunch. There's a lot of bugs out here. Oh, there's some flying overhead. Aren't they beautiful? But we can't count those. 
Only the ones that come out, right? Yeah, I mean, they came from around the side, and right. it's just we can't be sure that they came out or if they're the same ones returning, so right. I'd not count those. Well, I haven't seen a bat for like five minutes. I think we might be getting close to the end here. Shall we keep track of the time from yeah, the last bat know. scene? Yeah, we'll wait about five more minutes because we want to have 10 to 15 minutes with no bats. Okay. And then we can also stop when it gets too dark to see. Yeah. All right, it looks like it's been a think good, so? solid time to put okay. minutes with no activity. So let's tally up our, our ins and outs. So we've got 25 that came out and four that went in, right? Yeah. So we're going to do 25 and 4. So total bats counted, 25 minus 4, so 21. This data is going into a database that's going to be used to protect bats all around the Northeast. We learn about new sites every year through citizen science. Um, we, you know, they're kind of hidden. You don't know unless you're around right at dusk, and even then you might not notice. So it's really up to the local knowledge and, and people helping to report that to us. So. It's been really beneficial. Each year, New Hampshire Fish and Game's Hunter Education Program, with the help of over 450 volunteer instructors, trains over 3,000 students in hunter and trapper education. Learn more about hunting in New Hampshire at huntnh.com. We're down here on the New Hampshire coastline looking for signs of the monarch migration. Not our target species, but an interesting butterfly. This is the cabbage white butterfly. This is a common milkweed plant, and there's some evidence of chewing on it. There are several different species of moths and butterflies that will feed on milkweed plants. The common milkweed is important because it's the preferred food source of monarch caterpillars. Okay, got him. Black swallowtail occurs from sea level to mountains in a variety of habitats. And that is a male. So here's a monarch caterpillar. He'll grow a little bit bigger than he is right now, turn into a chrysalis, and go through his metamorphosis. And when he hatches out a couple weeks later, as an adult butterfly, it's that adult butterfly that will make the long 2,500 mile migration journey south to Mexico. On the way south to Mexico, you can sometimes see clusters of monarchs resting or feeding. The little guy. It was a viceroy. If you see on this, there's a vein right here, this black vein. It's on both sides of the wings, that black one right there. And if it has that vein, it's a viceroy butterfly. The monarch butterfly is also slightly larger than the viceroy. And another difference is the viceroy does not migrate. There it is, a monarch, monarch butterfly. The offspring of these long living monarchs only live six to eight weeks as they migrate back north. It takes several generations to make it back to New England. Landowners, if you want to help the monarch butterfly, plant some milkweed on your property. Every little bit helps. We hope you enjoyed this episode of New Hampshire's Wild Side. Remember to check back to see new content on nhwildside.com. Until next time, I'm Mark Beauchene. And I'm Christina Lupi. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. To learn more about life outdoors and the Hampshire Fishing Game, check out these videos. And remember to subscribe.